When we started Black Ocean about 17 years ago, one of the things that struck us was that within the world of independent poetry publishing, there wasn't a lot of faith in um, poetry to really carry itself as a frontless title. Um, you, at that time, the field was either really, we're talking about the big five, which are now the big four and maybe soon to be the big three, um, which sort of published poetry as a kind of charitable mission that they tucked away deep in their backlist. Um, or you had a very small handful of independent publishers um, that were publishing poetry, part of maybe a nonprofit mission. Um, but what we really wanted to do was put poetry out there that devoted the sort of publicity and design aesthetic that one would to a frontless title and come out of the gate with print runs that were, you know, 2000 copies strong which for poetry is about 10 times, I think, what the average poetry title sells. Uh, so that was our intention going into it. I mean, you might kind of call it a bit of naivete on my part. I had never as much as interned with a press or a literary magazine before. So um, it might have seemed overly ambitious to the outsider, but uh, it's actually worked for us and paid off. Well, I, you know, certainly our most well-known author is Zachary Schomburg, um, and he's been with us since the very beginning, both early in his career and early in the life of Black Ocean. Uh, we really kind of took a chance on each other at that time, and it's been a chance that has really kind of paid off, and we've both grown together. Um, I have always been impressed by the sort of unexpected and playful imagination of his poems, and his ability to connect with readers who wouldn't ordinarily find themselves drawn to poetry. I think he, as a result, has inspired an entire young generation of writers, which has been great to see. Um, also on our list, you know, we were super excited to have Helena Boberg's translation, Sense Violence, which was nominated for a Penn Award this year. You know, I really love her use of language, and I feel like the translation by Johannes Gorenson really brings that out. It's powerful and unusual, and her work is so feminist and reads like a call to action. Uh, we also, a couple of years ago, published Christian George Bagdanoff, um, who's doing great work in eco-poetics, which is an area where I'd really like to see us cultivate more writers. She also has a really fantastic DIY aesthetic, and certainly during the pandemic, she's been sending out these sort of fantastic tiny poem objects, sort of handmade with folded paper that uh, make me nostalgic for the zine days. Uh, I guess when I talk about the core of Black Ocean philosophy, I like to talk about uh, where the name comes from. And when I was uh, trying to think of a name for the press, um, I had one of many recurring dreams where I was standing at the precipice of this vast sea with these sort of enormous sea creatures lurking just below the surface. And I'd been having these dreams really my entire life where I'd either be standing at the edge of it or falling, sinking down through these uh, sort of watery abysses. And I was filled with this feeling of dread and awe. And that's what I sort of think of as the aesthetic uh, that we're going for when we choose our books or um, the litmus test is that dread and awe, that aesthetic shock uh, that you can get from a great work of art. I actually think of um, in Colin Wilson's book, Poetry and Mysticism, he recounts the story of Ramakrishna, this Indian saint and mystic. And when Ramakrishna was six, uh, he was walking across this rice field and a storm rose up. And as the dark clouds are filling the sky, a flock of white cranes then flies across it. And the beauty of the contrast between the black clouds and the white birds creates this experience of spiritual ecstasy in Ramakrishna that's so great he just collapses and goes unconscious. 
Um, so that's what I mean by aesthetic shock. Uh, and actually Wilson, I think, talks about it as affirmation consciousness. But I want, I want to feel like I'm on the verge of collapse when I engage with a poem, and I want our readers to feel that way too. So it's not that the book itself offers enlightenment, but I think of uh, the books that we publish or art in general as a kind of chisel creating fissures in us through which that marvel of the world around us can finally break through. That's the same feeling of dread and awe I felt in my dreams of the Black Oceans. So Rilke's annihilating angels, this enrapturing with majesty before me and then falling helplessly into it for the rest of my life. Uh, well, looking ahead to our future catalog, I am super excited for Madison MacArthur's book, uh, which comes out in 2022. Um, he came to us by a recommendation from Johannes Gorenson. He was one of his students. And I feel like Madison's bringing something truly new and unique to our list. There's a futuristic sci-fi element to his use of language and his sort of thematic component, but the, the syntax and the structure of his work feels really all his own. It was one of those things reading his poems that I was I immediately felt like it was a Black Ocean book. So it's kind of really hard to pigeonhole, but the kind of work that just sort of burrows into my thoughts for a while and sticks with me. Uh, we also have new work in the next year from a young Nigerian poet, Hussein Ahmed, and it will be his first book, which is exciting. Um, and we have a book by Ben Meyerson, who is more of a global poet who's based in both Spain and Toronto. Um, he's also a translator. Um, both of those books are so different, but speak to important directions in Black Ocean's mission. The sort of sense of supporting and encouraging innovative young writers, but as well as works that engage with a global audience. Um, out, outside of kind of our own catalog, at the moment, I'm personally obsessed with Sawako Nakayasu's work. Um, in particular, Some Girls Walk Into the Country They Are From, uh, which is out from WAVE. Um, I really love how it straddles this place between poetry and translation, which is really interesting to me and moves back and forth between languages. I'm really fascinated by that liminality and how foreign language can almost become like an earworm that kind of itches the mind and haunts your thoughts. Um, I've been learning Japanese mostly in vain, really terribly for the past several years. And I often find myself kind of caught in that same space between, particularly like when I'm waking up from dreams where I feel like I'm chasing a word around trying to connect to its meaning. And that's some of the experience that I have when reading her work. Well, in the immediate future, uh, which is the present, <laughs> um, Black Ocean has actually uh, formed what I affectionately refer to as an indie publishing conglomerate with another independent press that's based out of LA called Not A Cult. Um, Not A Cult has been around for I think about four or five years now. And I first became aware of them, I think just through Instagram or online, I was struck by their uh, aesthetic eye for design that they had garnered a big following uh, with seemed to be like very new uh, voices in poetry outside of academia. And they were doing really interesting things across genre. Um, and they sort of seemed like literary academic outsiders, which was really what Black Ocean was at the time that we started back in 2004 and put out our first books in 2006. Uh, I then met them about a year later at AWP and we kind of hit it off and Fast forward over a couple of years, and we have entered into a partnership to form a kind of umbrella org called Chapter House, um, which has a distribution partnership with Not A Cult and Black Ocean, and we are collaborating on forming a couple of other imprints. Uh, one is a progressive speculative fiction imprint and futurist nonfiction uh, and some other projects as well. But the idea here is that much like the really major, huge corporate publishing conglomerates 
have multiple imprints and then they share certain back office expenses and responsibilities and operations, we're doing the same thing at a very independent level. So Chapter House has now a distribution deal with Consortium, which was a step up for both Black Ocean and Not Occult. And we're also sharing other operational things like book design and printing costs and some other things. So it's, uh, again, kind of like stealing from more um, corporate business-minded people and applying them to that kind of like DIY punk rock aesthetic. <laughs> 